Hi, everyone. Welcome to Tech Talk, a podcast where Amit and I talk about various aspects of technology and its effect on socioeconomic and our cultural lives, etc. Today, we're going to talk about a very interesting topic. It's uh, humanoid robots. Uh, thank you, Amit, for coming up with this topic. This is a, this is a, we, we've talked about similar kind of topics, robotics, uh, before. But as the technology progresses and new, new uh, sort of uh, cutting edge companies are getting into robotics more and more and building more and more awesome robots, uh, and they are very much human like. So we thought, why not talk about again uh, about humanoid part of robotics? There are many ways robotics is advancing but humanoid ones are quite interesting and i think our audience would find it uh, quite fascinating as well so yeah let's uh, let's talk about humanoid robots so thanks uh, renath again uh, for that introduction uh, i was actually fascinated by this uh, topic because uh, tesla released a video recently about its own bots or humanoid robots and i it made me thinking like okay so tesla is now investing in it and we know there are certain other companies who have done a lot of good work in this area especially boston dynamics um, so these are the two companies who have developed, Honda has developed previously uh, a SIMO robot, ASIMO. Uh, so these companies have developed robots that look similar to human beings. And uh, that's why they are called humanoids. Uh, they are different from androids. Uh, so I'll just say that for now it's uh, humanoids because they are robots. They are not humans, but they look like humans. Androids are uh, part ma part ma part humans, part machines. So we are not there yet, uh, and they are they 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 look like uh, human beings, but they are completely robotics inside. And uh, an example of an android would be something from say Star Trek. Data is an android, uh, the character Data in Star Trek series, the Next Generation. So humanoid are uh, similar, but they just look like humans. They don't talk or they don't do anything and they are robots you can you can you if you look at them you can see that okay they are robots they are not like uh, they they have they are bipedal so they have bipedal uh, locomotion in the sense that they have two legs just like human beings there so yeah so they they have uh, they have two uh, legs they have two hands they have uh, they have a mouth uh, to talk if if they are talking but they definitely have a head and with some cameras that look like eyes uh, I don't think they have ears but they have, might have sensors uh, it depends on what kind of humanoid you're trying to build and they have a torso and um, uh, so yeah so they, they are very similar to humans and it's a very interesting piece of technology and yeah so that's why I wanted to talk about it yeah no absolutely and also it's thanks for giving this insight of different types of robot and I, I want to just uh, uh, dive a little bit deeper into it. So there are robots. They're like physical robots. I know we've talked about software robots before, but uh, today we're talking about physical robots. So when we talk about physical robots, we actually immediately think about humanoid robots, big thanks to the media, to be honest. Uh, but there are many, many different types of robots, robots that doesn't look like humans at all. They don't even have, you know, a, a like a sort of like a, torso at all they just have it could be a car or a vehicle or all of those things which are unmanned and uh sort of you know moves around with an objective you could uh call it a robot i mean to be honest as the technology advances more and more the definition of robot is becoming more and more vague because there are so many different types so um among all of the different types, a very, very popular or a very uh, sort of a identifiable type is the humanoid type, which is um, in early days, you know, decades ago, it was, uh, you know, it looked like sort of tin can shaped, you know, limbs, uh, you know, R2D2 and C3PO comes to mind. Yes, uh, from Star Wars, yes. Yeah. <laughs> um, and then, you know, as the technology advances, we became, you know, more and more advanced in, in sort of building more nuanced limbs and uh, sort of motor functions of those limbs. 
So uh, our robots became more and more like human. And the more I talk about it, I want to sort of mention this interesting topic called Uncanny Valley. I don't know if you know about this, Amit. Um, it's, it's a very interesting topic, actually, and uh, I think our audience will enjoy it as well. So the as humans, we whenever something look like us or something behaves like us, like humans, we find it, you know, we find it uh, more comfortable and uh, comfortable to deal with it. Um, as a result, uh, obviously, because there is that benefit, humans uh, kind of want to interact with other human looking things. That's why, you know, in robotics, humanoid robots have become popular because companies want to build things that will be, you know, largely accepted. Now, you know, uh, you know, uh, beloved movie characters like that we really liked, and then you know, more and more uh, robots, humanoid robots coming in picture in real life, and we we started liking them. But as it becomes too much like humans, um, the the sort of um, it we have uh, we started to feel like a have a like a strange, uncanny feeling. And that's when we stopped liking it because it's it's too much like humans, but not not quite there yet. Not quite there. So, so just when we reached that stage where it very much looks like human, um, behaves like human, but there is just something missing, and that's the that's the, at that stage we feel really uncomfortable and they have a strange feeling, and that. You know, if 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 you sort of put it put a chart like in an X Y uh, plot where uh, robots are slowly becoming more and more and more and more human, and the more and more we are finding them likable, likable, more and more likable, so the line is going up, 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 and then at one point uh, we don't find them comforting or friendly anymore. We feel very uncanny and strange, and that's when it drops the level of comfort, and then when it becomes fully like human then we feel comfortable again so it sort of creates a valley in that xy chart and that's what's called uncanny valley um obviously if it's fully like human then we don't know that it's a robot that's why we're more comfortable but it uh, there is a like a um, uh, sort of conspiracy theory uh, that why did our um, sort of why did evolution make us this way that something that is very much like humans but not humans and we should feel um, sort of awkward or uncomfortable or strange about it. Maybe there was something <laughs> that uh, was very harmful to us in the past, but uh, that's just a conspiracy theory and I don't know any science backing uh, regarding it. So I'm not uh, in any way supporting uh, that, uh, but it, it is an interesting theory to think about that as humanoid robots are becoming more and more like humans, there is a point where there is a drop in, in acceptance from humans. Interesting. I think I've, I've never heard this uh, theory, but I think I've, I've, I've heard bits of it. Like, yes, uh, people find it more acceptable when the robots look like uh, human beings. And it's, uh, it's incredible. Like human beings have evolved only on this planet with the specific uh, gravity, the specific temperature, etc. And, uh, uh, and a pair of eyes, a huge brain, uh, hands, uh, we have five fingers, um, we have legs, uh, and we can crawl, we can I mean, we can do so many things with our limbs and uh, I mean, evolution has played a huge part. And yes, if something looks like us, then we definitely accept it uh, more compared to if something looks like a dog or a lion or something else. Um, so, yeah, so I, I, I think I, I can relate to that. But this is a very interesting theory and I'll definitely want to read more about it. And thanks for sharing this because I think it's a, it's a interesting thing to uh, definitely know about, especially when these robots are now going to be more and more part of our lives and they already are i mean in some scenarios they already are but i think let's take take a step back and think about okay so we have uh, robots that look like humans and we know that okay it's uh, good for people because people find it more acceptable um so so let's try to create um, robots with uh, that look like humans so and we've talked about the appearance as well they just look like humans with the head hands legs torso everything 
so that's that but then what are the uh, mechanics behind running a robot so a robot normally is autonomous so and 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 some robots are uh, remote controlled so you used to have remote control robots uh, toy robots uh, my son is growing up so some people gift him toys i mean he's too young for robots but he still has a remote control car a remote control excavator etc so but i i remember from my childhood that i was gifted a robot uh you put some batteries and you just switch it on and it'll do some moves so it'll do that those moves autonomously so it definitely has some uh chip uh that has a program in it uh and that program will tell it what to do um more advanced robots will uh take inputs from the sensors and process them and then uh give an output in the form of motion in the form of uh, some action or some kind of voice response or maybe a nod of head etc so so th so th these are taking from the sensors and these sensors could be anything it could be uh, it could be for uh, a cameras to record what's uh, what they are viewing so then you can also have algorithms that recognize uh, what the surroundings are through say machine vision we've talked about machine vision and then we've talked about ai so how how do we leverage that then there is this whole thing of balance so if they are uh, look like humans they have to balance themselves we find balancing very easy uh, as we grow up i i'm seeing my son growing up so he he initially he found it very difficult but then he got a hang of it uh, and say try to balance yourself on a skateboard so that's again a, a, uh, taking it to the next level um so yeah so balance is another aspect and then there are other things like okay how do we power the robot where is the battery pack so then these are all the mechanics and the algorithms that have to be on a chip and the hardware that's needed and then how how strong is it uh, what are the materials how do we make it more flexible how do we uh, make the robot do all the range of human motions like our hands can move in as many directions as possible can the robot do that how do we make sure the grip of our fingers uh, can uh, uh, replicate can be replicated on the robot because we can lift an egg without breaking it can a robot do the same thing and can then a robot pull a car with the same uh, maybe with a bigger force so how do you uh, make a robot understand all that so there are different nuances to all these things and i think that's where it becomes more and more interesting yeah yeah absolutely there's so many ways you can think about um you know uh, the there's so many aspects to think about when you're thinking about humanoid robot but i keep coming back to the 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 first you know the the core of how we landed on on this humanoid design because there could be robots um which are uh, built for a specific purpose and there could be robots that are built for generic like all all you know generic general purpose robots if you like now for both cases um as if you are just thinking about an engineer with no sort of um, view of socioeconomic interaction how the you know the human ergonomics and how it will do all of these things you would just come up with the best design for to perform a specific task if you're doing a, a, a special purpose robot or for even for generic things you would have various designs and that design of a robot may not look like humanoid at all but how did we end it up how did we how do we still have the humanoid uh, sort of shape as as um, as one of the popular types because obviously you know millions and millions of years of evolution has sort of brought about these shapes which uh, are kind of uh, ruling the world um, you know uh, uh, humans so it there obviously are various benefits for a general purpose robot to have the similar kind of shape and similar kind of ability because it's obviously you know when we talk about how did human became the top of the food chain if you if you want to put it that way um it is because of our big brain but on a humanoid robot the processor is not going to be in in the head like we have however um when we were confronted with a predator for example a tiger it's not i think our brain had some 
uh, sort of contribution on on for us surviving. Flight but I mechanism. think our... that's called the flight mechanism. Fear of flight. Yeah, yeah. Some but... people get afraid. Some people start running. So the fear yeah, of yeah. Mechanism. So that decision making part might be done by the brain. But if if your decision is to do flight, you should be able to take flight very quickly and survive. And a lot of us did, which is why we still exist. So um, we 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 must not forget the sort of the nuanced design that we've sort of evolved into. And that is also a, a very sort of a strong design that have evolved and became, you know, was perfected over millions of years of evolution. So um, as soon as we, you know, try to find a solution to a problem, usually uh, when we look to look at the nature, we find a good one. And in, in this case, looking at the ne- nature is like looking in the mirror. And uh, we found the best kind of general purpose robot and what are the sh- what shape it could be. Now, one could argue that, um, you know, the legs we have are not really good for moving moving fast you know we could have had wheels with axles uh, although evolution wouldn't allow that but that's a different topic altogether but we might think that that would be a better design but when it comes to terrain like uh, surface we where or stairs or sort of mountainous areas over there wheels or even the 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 sort of the gripped wheels that they have in tanks wouldn't really work the way two legs work so there are many general purpose benefits for humanoid robot, not just to be a friend to humans, which is also an important part, of course, but there are many benefits of, of this design anyway. And now how do we make this design possible with all of these uh, sort of constraints, you know, mechanical constraints, electrical constraints, as you mentioned, how do we power it, etc.? That's obviously a completely a new era of problems because the way we feel ourselves is completely different because it's a chemical reaction, the, how we generate energy. But it's, a, well, batteries are also doing chemical en- reaction, but it's a kind of a different way. But um, the first thing that comes to mind when we're talking about power, our battery, uh, is that the way we do it is that we sort of uh, um, continuously sort of uh, consume uh, fuel um, in order for us to keep going food. and we consume have a food. lot of consume yes <laughs> that's what I mean by fuel for humans and uh, we have a lot of backups I mean even people can survive after you know five days even um, with without food not water but that's uh, that's a different diff- that's a different topic altogether but um if we looked at the problem that way maybe then we could we could think about uh, better solutions i mean obviously using solar panels to continuously recharge may not be uh, technically advanced enough technologically advanced enough to work because the amount of power generated is may not be enough but yeah it's interesting how these um, companies who are at the cutting edge of of this now, like Boston Dynamics, and apparently with the new news, Tesla is also very much onto it, um, onto this uh, this this area now as well. Uh, is it's a very interesting space and uh, one to sort of watch out for. Definitely, and I think you put it right. Like why why robot should look like us and what advantages it has. So I think uh, we are not very fast. That's for sure. Uh, we are not very strong. Again, uh, there are stronger animals in the in the world. Um, uh, we don't have a great vision. Uh, we don't have a great sense of smell, taste, etc. So we are very average when it comes to comparison. But as a package, I think we are very good uh, because we have a enlarged brain compared to all other species, and that has given us an ability to rule the world. But uh, and given the hands, so I think. Um, if you don't have the opposing thumb you it's very difficult for us to hold any tool without the opposing thumb it's difficult to grab anything and then work with it so our hands give us an advantage where we can use tools uh, stones we can use uh, wood we can create fire we can uh, create wheels we can create tools to cast iron etc so that gave us a very uh, specific advantage over animals uh, that's why the animals never went beyond so a lion cannot hold a, a screwdriver 
a lion can't hold a drill machine like we can so it loses out on that part um, maybe we can't run as fast or maybe we do, are not as strong as a lion but we can hold a screwdriver and we can hold a drill and we can do a lot of things with those kind of tools and that gives us very specific advantages and i think um, again with when it comes to uh, bipedal motion so it's very rare for uh, in the animal world to see bipedal movement uh, it's maybe only the monkeys and monkeys also use a lot of their hands uh, gorillas chimpanzees they use a lot of their hands so they are very strong upper body um, and they have uh, good legs to hang themselves but if you look at the majority of the animal world they're all uh, four limbs to walk around and move and that gives them specific advantages but I think when it comes to balancing I think that gives us advantage because then we can try to swim we can try to stand on things we can go up the stairs we can we can do we can balance ourselves on a rope etc so it gives us again very specific advantages uh, so yeah so there are limitations but there are advantages and I think it's it's a good thing to think about like why uh, why like us because I think the problems that we are trying to solve are problems for us and the reason we are trying to create uh, trying to create these robots is to replace some of the uh, manual work that we are doing say construction work say drilling uh, in the roads it creates a lot of noise I don't want to uh, expose myself to that kind of noise or even that kind of vibration when I'm holding the drill to drill a road I don't want to do that I don't want to go down the sewer maybe I'll send a robot because it's a very dirty job uh, so I don't want to go up a high electric uh, cable it's quite high I can fall I can get electrocuted etc so and then I don't want to go into a radioactive zone uh, where I need to operate tools but I, I can't go because of uh, my uh, because I can get cancer I can I can have mutations in my body so th there are very specific scenarios for which we need humanoid robots even on the assembly line we maybe we have to get rid of people on the assembly line and try to replace them with robots so it's i'm not saying that it's a it's a bad for the people who are already working there but those people can do some other constructive work so we can use them for something else where they can be better utilized so i think it's a, it's a win-win situation and that's where the trend is uh, going towards like uh, and plus also companionship in the age of uh, sorry social media and uh, covid there is a specific advantages of uh, being uh, humans and that's why i think most of the companies are now investing in uh, robots that look like human beings and especially tesla now entering this market and it gives us an advantage especially on this planet I mean, if you go on, say, moon or Mars, you might need a different set of robots. So, like, you have rovers that can go across different terrains because you still don't need a lot of tools. You still are exploring. So, for exploring, wheels are the fastest way to move rather than having uh, a robots uh, walking on stones and pebbles and trying to fall. So, wheels are much more stable. Um, so, that's why... Uh, it's a, a different uh, type of robot and 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 you mentioned that there are specific robots for specific things but i think um, human robots have those advantages and i think um, another thing is that if we get rid of the menial work and they are done by humanoid robots then it gives us a lot of time to do other creative stuff other innovative stuff it's not to say that um, i mean we are trying to get rid of uh, people uh, from the from their menial jobs but it's just to make sure that the robots are uh, doing those stuff which are very boring repetitive and not very good for your mind but uh, and then people can take up other other roles um, other jobs opportunities which are more uh, based on their cognitive skills and uh, they can um, utilize their abilities much better yeah i mean um there is um i know th this could be a controversial kind of topic but um also it's not fully related to robots but you know as you were mentioning the the jobs that um you know we want to give humans more cognitive jobs i was actually you know thinking uh, of course yeah that is always more fun and meaningful a lot of the times but sometimes doing something repetitive is a little bit therapeutic <laughs> and uh, um you know i was doing ironing and uh, i was thinking that sometimes it's just it's just you know you just want to do move you know do the similar movements without having to do a lot of cognitive thinking 
but I guess uh, we are making it so that the future world will not have much of those work for humans to do, which uh, I don't know what kind of effect it will have, but it's, uh, it's an interesting thing to think about. I'm just uh, uh, saying out loud, uh, thinking out loud, but uh, yeah. I mean, as humanoid robots become more and more advanced and can do all of these, uh, you know, like ironing or washing dishes and stuff like that, um, you know, it 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 takes away those tasks for, from humans to do. But uh, sometimes humans do enjoy some of those things just to sort of zone out and uh, do them. So I think, uh, yeah, I think that that's a very good point. But then if you see, uh, we have robo vacuums. It doesn't mean that we mm -hmm. can't do vacuum. We have Dyson and it can do a great vacuum, but then it needs a human to operate it. So I think mm -hmm. you will still have those kind of uh, opportunities. If you want to do things by yourself, you will have certain things which are not smart enough for them for uh, those tools to operate by themselves, which are just uh, good enough. Because see, we have a dishwasher which is kind of a robot, mm -hmm. which can yes. automatically wash uh, dishes, but we still wash dishes with our hands. And there is still dishwashing liquid being sold in the supermarkets. So dishwashing mm -hmm. has not gone anywhere. I mean, people still do dishes by themselves, mm -hmm. even though they have dishwashers, especially in a country like UK, where almost every house will have a dishwasher or a washing machine. People still uh, wash their dishes or sometimes even wash their clothes. So yeah, there, there will be always opportunities for people to do such uh, things if they so want but i think mm -hmm. the whole idea is that if you uh, if you have limited number of hours in a day you would you mm -hmm. rather spend them on ironing clothes or would you rather go out and do something like you mm -hmm. want to go out to yes. play tennis you want to go out to explore on a hike or a walk i think those are things that humans enjoy even more than maybe ironing right ah yes <laughs> that is true actually that's that's actually a good good um, counter um, of, of what I said. Uh, okay, so let's, uh, let's now talk about, um, you know, the AI part of um, uh, robotics. So we are making the robots look more and more like humans. Now, we are also at the same time separately, I guess, in, in you know, research and technological advancement is happening. So, uh, you know, uh, uh, non-humans can start to think or process information like humans. And once those thing, two things are combined, that would be a leap into uh, sort of humanoid robotics because it would not only look and sort of uh, behave like uh, humans or close to humans, but also be able to solve generic problems like humans when given in any scenario, even without context. So um, that would be powerful and, you know, that ha obviously comes with its certain challenges. Um, the first thing that comes to mind is the processing power and where to house it. I mean, we house it in our brain on top of our necks. Uh, and one could argue that that, that may not be the best design. <laughs> um, and when there are certain structural differences between robots and humans, uh, you know, the way we store and process energy and the way we sort of um, have sort of uh, the healing ability and the way we sort of have our motor functions, these are all structurally different. And for those differences, that could have an effect on on the design and that makes me think about the boston dynamics uh, uh sort of prototypes of of humanoid robots which didn't have a head and had everything else so it's a, it's another uh, sort of super interesting thing to think about um how do you do the processing because yeah we have made recently a lot of advancement in ai technology um but that requires you know, a very specific type of chip only designed by NVIDIA and um, apparently is, is well, not only uh, the NVIDIA chips can do it, but they are sort of dedicatedly good at it. Um, and those are quite expensive, power hungry and uh, space hungry and heat generating. So all of these questions and constraints, how would uh, the, the sort of the next Yes, um, you know, uh, companies solve those problems. It's interesting space to sort of uh, tune in every now and then. 
definitely and i think you have raised a very interesting uh, argument where like uh, i mean you need a lot of processing power and you can't store that processing power on the robot itself so they will need to connect uh, to some kind of an internet or maybe some kind of network where they can connect and talk to a central server and just get a response because if you look at chat gpt chat gpt is an ai tool um, and it has uh, it has scanned through thousands of websites, millions of websites, and then through machine learning, it has uh, gained some kind of insight, and now it can j predict the next word that should come after a specific word. So, say I say hi, normally the next word that comes after hi is how are you? So that's the next uh, words, and that's what what it predict based on millions of text or uh, sites it has uh, browsed through. Now imagine you have all that ability, but it's still a very specific problem. It is going through websites, predicting what the next word is. It's not trying to, and it's and it's doing only one thing. It's trying to generate words. It's not doing anything. It's generating words. It's not generating sound. Uh, there is a different AI tool for generating images. There is a different AI tool for generating videos. But they're all again software related. There is nothing hardware. They they are still not able to hold a screwdriver. They're still not able able to hold a drill. And you can say that okay, maybe it's not needed. But then it is needed because we live in a physical world. Are they able to drive a car? ChatGPT can't drive a car. So we again need a specific robot to solve that problem. So Tesla again with their uh, cars. They are trying to go for autonomous driving, full self-driving. So that's again solving a very specific problem. Can they now go on a hike? So again, again a different problem. So I think the the amount of problems that we have solved as human beings are immense and they have still not been touched by robots. I think we are at a very, very, very initial stage of what robots can do. I think the world is now obsessed with software, but the software has to go somewhere and explore and do something. And for that, you need hardware. And that hardware also has to uh, go through the environment, withstand heat, withstand cold, uh, power itself, do the processing on board if you don't have an internet connection, etc., etc. So Starlink could be, uh, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm, if, if you think out loud, maybe Starlink is the internet backbone on which the Tesla robots will work and connect and talk to each other. And with the uh, the problem solving uh, that they are uh, trying to do by looking at their surroundings, I think it will build up. And then once one robot runs, uh, learns something, all the other robots have learned the same thing. So they don't have to train the robots again. So I think with that mechanism, it can work out really well. But yeah, it just... Uh, I'm yeah, it's just a little bit of uh, working out too well, to be honest, because, yeah, so far in my head, I was thinking about, you know, robots from different manufacturers, different companies doing different things, and they're all living in an ecosystem like different types of people, um, you know, from different countries or different preferences, living in harmony in a, in a society, etc. But now that you've talked about a you know, globally interconnected network of an army of robots, that just be, <laughs> uh, sort of brings a little bit of a sort of a concern where if it, if it does fall onto the wrong hands and at the same time also if AI technology improves to a degree where it is, uh, it can sort of um, come up with its, uh, for, uh, come up to its own objectives, then all of these could be a kind of a serious concern. And it, it just feels like that we will be in a science fiction movie. I don't want to mention which one, but uh, one of them for sure. No, I think I think uh, we have, uh, I think we understand AI very little. I think uh, whatever AI progress that we are seeing now is very software related, very uh, unlikely it's hardware related. And hardware related, are there, there are very few companies because it requires far more investment and there are far more variables to handle when you're just walking from, say, your door to the garden. So like you have to take a step, the terrain, the, you, it, it, the floor might change from a carpet to a wooden floor. Uh, you will have to open a door. You will have to look through a glass. You can maybe go through the glass because you can't differentiate between glass and uh, the real object. So there's machine learning, uh, some machine vision involved. There's a lot of variables that a robot has to handle before it can just go from the door to the uh, garden. Now, whatever Boston Dynamics video that we have seen, I think if you look at the behind the scenes video, they first create a setup and then 
they train the robot to go through that setup and the robot learns by going through that setup again and again and again and again and once it has mastered it then it works autonomously but that training part still requires the robot to go through that kind of thing again and again and again and that's where i think that's where machine learning or other things might help but this is a hardware challenge and for a hardware challenge you have to do it you have to train it uh, through hardware only you cannot teach tell a robot to balance it a certain way maybe you can think about all the variables but we don't do that in our head it's all instinctive uh, yes yes absolutely that general intelligence um it's still it, far it, away it's still far, far away, away. Yes. It's that is far away. away. And I mean, how specific it is. problems, yes, I yeah. think we are getting there. But general intelligence, very, very far away. Very, very far away. And chat GPT, by the way, I think we've, we've talked about it in our earlier episode about chat GPT. Chat GPT doesn't have general intelligence. It may appear as if it has it, but um, it doesn't at all. It's just sort of um, uh, telling you what the most likely response of a sentence or multiple sentences should be, but not an understanding of what it's doing. But eventually, when we do come closer and closer to general intelligence, as well as become more technologically advanced and advanced with uh, humanoid robots, it would be very interesting to see how, uh, when both of these things are combined. And as you rightly said, uh, the carrying that processing power on board of the robot, uh, the, the, the structure is actually quite, um, unlikely scenario and, uh, un, you know, unrealistic. So, um, it would be, uh, connecting with the internet to, uh, to have like a sort of a, you know, bi-directional communication to send the problem and bring back the output, what it should do. And it would be quite interesting to sort of interact with, with such a uh, creature, if you'd like, uh, <laughs> yes. in future. Uh, I think uh, Elon Musk recently said in one of his interviews with Wall Street Journal, maybe we'll share that video here. And it was a very fascinating interview. Uh, maybe not Wall Street, maybe someone else, I can't figure, I can't remember right now. But in that video, he said that uh, Elon, uh, the uh, Tesla AI or the AI being developed by Tesla is maybe 10 or 15, or maybe maybe uh, way ahead of OpenAI's uh, chat GPT ah. or any other AI tool because they have to right. deal with hardware variables. They are looking at environmental variables. They are not looking at software. Software you can do programmatically. That we have already automated a lot of stuff. But uh, hardware is where the real challenge is, where you have to interact with something that you don't have any control. You don't have control about when an earthquake will happen. You don't have a control mm. of when a tsunami will happen. You don't have a control mm. of what the temperature will be outside the next day. You can't predict when it will rain. And you can't predict yeah. what the terrain will be wherever you go, especially in an unexplored territory. So yeah, that's... that is, those are challenges. But at the same time, we've got to still also think about that they will have a lot more senses and a lot more powerful uh, senses than humans. I mean, we have five senses, including the tactile one. But uh, they have so many different kind of sensors, even the vision, we only see the visible light spectrum, but they will be able to see ultraviolet to infrared and much more, maybe the microwaves as well. Uh, so, you know, their experience of surroundings would be vastly different than ours. Um, yes, as you said, you know, they might not be able to predict earthquake, but they could potentially be alert, at, you know, five minutes before that, you know, because they're going to be connected to the internet and uh, the nearby Richter scale. Um, so they will have a lot more advantage in terms of information gathering and then how to process the information and make the right decision that's a that's the challenge that i'm that's where i'm really the challenge is. exactly yeah. because I, let me give you an example so recently I, I i we got installed a harvey water softener and the harvey water softener softens the water in your house especially the hard water because it uh, gives lime scale over all your uh, accessories that uh, use water now we also had a, a water the drinking water tap and that requires a separate filter because that we co you can't you should not be drinking soft water and that filter has to be changed every 12 months so i ordered uh, the filter and i uh, tried to install it by myself by looking at some youtube videos unfortunately the video that was there was not the same so now i have a very specific hardware problem i have to change the filter okay and i changed the filter and the water started leaking 
and i called the support staff and they they couldn't help me because of course they 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 can't see what the issue is now in a similar situation what would a human i do so it will have to try to understand what the problem is so the problem is i try to fit a filter it starts leaking now i have to look at all the possible options so i i i try to stop the tap uh, stop the water supply try to see if i'm not fitting it correctly try to look at the filter itself and figure out how to solve this problem and the people in the support uh, in the, in the call f- from the support they said uh, it would require about 2 uh, uh, to 3 weeks to get an engineer down there and it would they, it would cost me 160 pounds plus vat etc just for f- uh, fixing a filter and i thought to myself that filter it looks very easy i'm doing something wrong but i have to figure out what it is now imagine this is a very very specific scenario i have never been trained to do anything like that and i am now encountered with this scenario how do i solve it so the first thing i do is take a video of what where i'm trying to fit the filter so i took a video then i try to figure out what the angle is what direction i'm looking at and is it the right thing and then i try to see what's on top of the filter and where it has to go so basically what happened is when i removed the old filter the two pipes that uh, gets the water inside the filter that moved i just had to turn it and then uh, fit the filter and it worked it's a very specific right. problem which for which you can't train anyone and you know yes. you encounter in the real world now imagine a robot has to do the same thing a very specific thing like <laughs> suppose there is an earthquake it can detect an earthquake has come but now you have to train the robot how to handle in those situations and that situation the robot has never encountered that's general intelligence how mm-hmm. do you train some humanoid robot to handle a situation that it has never encountered See, you absolutely and you can train them on anything that you already know but the unknown is where the intelligence comes absolutely absolutely one of the things i think i would i would pick up on this story a, 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 an aspect which may you may not have thought about is that the incentive that you tried again is because of the associated cost yeah. now when would a humanoid try something again after failing first time if it if it has less than 10% battery would it try harder um if it has no internet connection would it then keep trying for internet con- to re-, re reestablish connection so it can do the job or would it move to another so the incentives that are for us are, you know it would be different in they will be incentivized differently they might not care that they only have 5% exactly. battery because we may program them that you know you don't have to care if you if you if you die just keep doing the job until you can so that might be a, and over there that's that's the scenario where i we might actually have a conflict with what a generally intelligent robot would want because it may not want to uh uh carry on yeah exactly <laughs> and, and and i think that's where people i think they get uh, excited or also i think they misunderstand ai i think agi is very very uh, far ahead in the future because to to have I mean, wants and needs and incentives like that that's that's no way something out of the unknown like if you don't mm. know about something and so so i think i i read somewhere or i heard some some podcast or some place where they said i will be worried when the ai can do something that it has not been trained on mm right if you have okay. never given a ai a text about religion and it still comes up with the concept of god that's something worrying but if you have exposed it to a text or some kind of thing many many that, texts many texts that, that talk you know, about religion talk about god then then yes, then yes then that's fine because you have trained it on that data but if it has not encountered that data any time how can it come up with that concept i'm not talking about creating code you can create a code by connecting the dots but the concept itself of code mm-hmm. if you never give it yes. a concept of code like you can actually create a program to do something or you can <laughs> you can have a concept of religion to and and have god if that whole concept is not there then it's very difficult science comes from correlation i mean you correlate you predict you do experiments and then you figure out things because we i mean how would einstein have thought about space time continuum or time travel or whatever he thought about like it's it's very difficult to imagine if you have not been exposed to those things but we have a specific way of doing experiments and figuring out things that we have never seen or heard that 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 our senses don't trust 
or we can't believe our senses that okay quantum computing can actually exist there is superposition that happens and uh, i mean there are so many things that our senses tell us but it's all wrong and it's all figuring out <laughs> yes. things and that's a very difficult problem to solve yes absolutely and uh, you know i'm i'm sort of anxiously and cautiously waiting for for um for what happens next and uh, definitely tuning in and watching this space and hopefully our audience will also be watching this space and tune in with us so we can share this journey together um this has been a, actually quite an interesting conversation amit thank you for that and hopefully the audience also enjoyed it very much and we look forward to seeing you guys in our next episode thank you all for listening thanks thanks everyone thanks for tuning in and yeah had a good conversation thanks very much bye